Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my very pleasure to have uh, Sven Jacobs uh, here. So Sven Jacobs is a researcher in Sapuka University. He is uh, very well known in the CAF and the BMKI community, so the former master community, about this uh, his impressive work about parameter parameterized verification and synthesis. So uh, this is this talk belongs to one of our formal methods and the software dependability lectures where the, the content of this lecture will be placed uh, after this uh, this talk on YouTube. So let's all time to see us. Thank you. Um, so what I will present is an overview of the work that, that I did in Spionex with a lot of co-authors um, that are given here roughly in the order of appearance in the talk. Um, the most, two most important ones are Roderick and Irat, uh, with whom I started this, this line of research. <clears throat> okay, so let's jump right in. What is, in general, the problem that we're looking at? The problem is concurrent or distributed systems, uh, be it hardware or software or really networks of um, computers that communicate and want to achieve some tasks together or um, at least satisfy together some, some requirements. And often these systems are parametric in the number of components. So you could always think about adding more threads to your program, adding more components to your network, more cores to your CPU, and you, you still want them to, to work regardless of the number of components. And um, ensuring that these systems are correct is difficult already for a fixed number of components and it's even harder if uh, you think about it in a parametric number of components. Okay, so in general this is a very difficult problem and let's think about a bit uh, how do we, how do we, could we assure that uh, the system is correct. So, of course, um, or maybe if you're not uh, into that you have to trust me, of course the answer is formal methods uh, and there are there are two possibilities how to use formal methods, roughly uh, two, two um, I, will, I will treat them as two possibilities. Uh, one is the, what I call the verification workflow. That means you, uh, so you start, in both cases you start with, uh, with a designer of the system with some requirements in his mind, and in the verification workflow you, as, as is usual, you implement the system by hand, and then you go and you formalize the requirements and uh, write down a formal specification. And then you, you take some existing tool and to check your implementation against the specification. This is what's called verification. And verification may either tell you, yes, the system is correct, so it satisfies the specification, uh, or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, well then in the verification workflow, what you have to do is go into a loop of trying to fix the bugs and go back to verification until eventually, hopefully, your, your model checker or your theorem prover tells you that um, the system is correct. Okay, and uh, this is standard practice for some systems and some properties. Um, so, um, at least in, in hardware design, uh, some, some things uh, nowadays are always uh, formally verified. And also, when you consider parameterized systems, there's very active research in, in this area. So for, for verification, there's, there's a lot of things going on. And um, so this is the, the one formal methods approach. The other formal methods approach would be the synthesis workflow. And this is much more appealing from a theoretical perspective, at least, because it makes it easier for the designer. What the designer does is he directly, or she, directly formalizes the requirements. So this is the first step. And then from there, we use the synthesis tool and automatically obtain an implementation that satisfies the specification. And uh, that's all. So we don't have to verify what we implemented, and we don't have a loop of bug fixing, and we saved the manual implementation in the first place. So this is much more appealing from a desired perspective. <clears throat> Okay, the, the drawback, of course, this is also much more expensive computationally uh, and it might be even undecidable in cases where verification is still decidable. That means there, there simply doesn't exist an automatic way um, 
an automatic tool that can, for all specifications, produce the implementation that you want. This is, uh, for example, parameterized verification can also be understandable or is in general understandable. Uh, but as long as you talk about a fixed number of components and your components are only finite state, then, then verification is decidable. And, and synthesis is already understandable for a fixed number of finite state components. Okay, and accordingly, or, or not a big surprise, uh, since even these cases are understandable, uh, there was little previous work um, on parameterized systems, synthesizing parameterized systems before we started this. <clears throat> Okay, so this is, this is the, the environment that, that we're working in. We want to, to verify or synthesize systems with a parameterized number of components. So one, one concrete example um, that has been a benchmark uh, for synthesis tools for a while is the AMBA bus controller. So essentially what you have is a bus and a number of masters and clients that want to communicate over this bus and you have a controller that arbitrates the access um, to the bus. So it should guarantee that no two masters write to the bus at the same time and some advanced properties that every master that uh, wants success eventually gets success and there are locked accesses, bursts, and some, some other features. And all of that has been considered as a synthesis benchmark before our work. Um, and, and this benchmark is naturally parameterized in the number of masters that want to access the bus. And, and the previous work has shown that it becomes much more difficult when you increase the number of masters. And actually, there's a sequence of papers that always tries to, to uh, synthesize the bus for uh, the controller for an increasing number of masters. And some, some years of research went into that before we came to it. <clears throat> OK, here's what, what their tools, what the behavior of their tools, tools looks like. So the synthesis time um, increases at, from some point on steeply in the number of masters uh, with a little bump there. Um, and what's, what's maybe even more surprising, surprising, also the circuit size. So when you implement the synthesized controller in hardware, um, also the circuit size increases steeply in the number of masters. Whereas if you look at the manual implementation, the green line down here, it stays very small and is essentially linear in the number of masters. Whereas this one looks like an exponential or something like that. <clears throat> okay, so this, this is uh, not good, at least. And, and what you would assume is, well, if I have a controller for, that works for, I don't know, uh, six masters, it shouldn't be so difficult to get one that works for eight masters. It's, it's not, an, not an inherently different problem. Okay, so what I will show you is that you can indeed avoid this explosion uh, both in time and in, in space, and uh, we can solve the general case once and for all, and then obtain a system that is correct for any number of masters. Um, obtain like a re recipe for a system. Okay, and what's the idea? How to how to obtain such a thing? The idea is to synthesize not one system that handles all the masters, but synthesize components where each component talks to one of the masters. And of course, to, to, uh, to ensure that, that the global specification is also satisfied, these components have to communicate somehow. So that means um, we, can, we can use this approach not only if we talk about a system that is really distributed or concurrent, but we can also take something that is, that is usually just a monolithic block, but we want to consider different sizes for that block, and we, we still um, separate it into components. And the idea is that, that we synthesize these components, and then we can plug together as many components as we want. OK, so an arbitrary number. But the question still is, uh, so it hasn't been answered before, how can we ensure correctness in, in this setting, where we synthesize the components and plug them together and want them to be uh, correct regardless of their number? OK. Now, um, that explains the general setting and the idea, and this is this is this will be the rest of the talk. I will first give you the, the basics, the the underlying approach that we have developed. Then go to back to the application, the, the AMBA bus controller, and show you a bit of what we had to do to really make the basic approach work on this example. And finally, I'll, I'll mention briefly a, a number of follow-up works that that try to make the 
the approach more complete or extend it to, to other systems. Okay. Uh, um, feel free to, to interrupt me at any time if you have questions. So this, this can so be. So just a quick question for the manually implemented code. What is roughly the number of sites? So you are talking about it's very small, but is it just a 400 lines of code or it's uh, less? Um, I mean, this was in um, this was given in, in circuit size. Uh, okay. In, in, in cell count, uh, I don't know what it, what exactly it is, but here it's. It's more like uh, 10,000 versus 600,000 for, for 10 masters. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so, yeah, for the, for the basic approach now. So, uh, how can we go about and, and solve this problem in general? Um, I'll give a bit of a, of a formal background so that we, if you're interested in it, you, you have some insight in, in how it actually works. Um, so the specification language that we use is a temporal logic, linear temporal logic, temporal operators globally, finally, until you have propositional variables and usual propositional connectives and can, can then write um, behaviors over time. And then uh, we have architectures that tell us how, how the system is composed, so how many components are there in the system and what are their inputs and outputs and how can they communicate with each other. So these will be our inputs, um, what, we, what we all want to obtain as an implementation, and uh, the theoretical approach will give us an implementation as a label transition system, and this can then be translated to, to a circuit or to a, to, to a software. <clears throat> okay, and then, so this is for a fixed number of components currently, Then the synthesis problem is given such a uh, specification in LTL and an architecture find implementations for all the components in the architecture such that the implementations uh, in the architecture satisfy uh, the specification. This is the synthesis problem for a fixed number of components. Now if we want to talk about the, the parameterized synthesis problem, we need to extend this a bit. We extend the specification language to index LTL. That means our propositional variables will be indexed and these indices refer to, to the components in the system. So PI means P should hold four component I. And then we have quantifiers over the components. Something should hold for all components, or there should exist a component such that it holds. A parameterized ar architecture is a, a sequence of architectures. We will see later on, for example, the sequence of all rings of increasing size. And then the parameter synthesis problem is Given an indexed specification and the parameterized architecture, find now, we assume for this talk, find a single implementation for a component such that if you plug this component into any of, of the architectures in your sequence, uh, then the resulting system will satisfy the, the indexed LTL specification. Okay, so this is uh, the parameterized synthesis problem that, that we want to solve. <clears throat> okay, now, how, how could we solve this? How could we obtain these implementations and, and be sure that they work uh, regardless of the size of the system? Well, one, one approach would be uh, we, use, um, we use existing methods, and that is synthesis for a finite number of components and parameterized verification. So we we, we start from, from a fixed size architecture, so we, we just pick one uh, out of our parameterized architecture and instantiate the, the index LTL specification to a, to a regular LTL specification, and then we just synthesize a component. This can be done, for example, with bounded synthesis. <coughs> and this component now uh, we give to a parameterized verification tool and let it tell us whether, whether parameterized verification succeeds regardless of the size of the system uh, for this component that we just synthesized in a fixed size system. Now this might work by chance. You might find out that this component actually is correct for an arbitrary size. Uh, but on the other hand, chances are good that it's not correct in general, and then you would have to go back and, and synthesize it in a bigger architecture or try to somehow modify it. To, to make this work. So 
So, so just a question. So just to understand a little bit. So you're using this uh, uh, particular instance as a tile for. So how does that relate to to, to the other graph there? So, so is this a tile that you're using and and, uh, and uh, to make build up a parametrized version? Or? So, so yeah. I'm not sure if I understand correctly, but but I think yes. So, so what we would do here is we fix the size of the system and we synthesize something that, that works in a fixed size system and then we just check whether it would also work in the bigger system. So what is the bigger system here? So is it to just picking this so, tile and then... And so, we, we, so the synthesis algorithm ensures that, that what, we, what we synthesize, this component, works in a system of this fixed size that, we, that we've chosen and then the progress verification algorithm checks whether it works for all sizes. With the same implementation so that for, for the component. So can I say this way, for example, in this case you have you ask for this a controller for this read of four elements, and then you generate one com a solution, and then just now try to say that this this solution works for an arbitrary size of the read. Ah, okay. So it's not the time. It's really you're really going inside the program and really inside your or architecture and adding more components. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, and the, besides never being sure whether you, you find a solution, the problem with this approach now is if you find out that, that the verification is not successful, that, that there is some size for which the, the system or this component is not correct, um, then you have to go back and synthesize something new in a bigger architecture and that doesn't scale. You, uh, um, synthesis uh, in the number of components uh, scales very badly. Okay, um, so we, we don't want to use this idea, so we took a step back and said, what can we do if we directly start from the parameterized synthesis problem? And here the idea is, in addition to the, to the specification um, and the architecture, we want to, def to define or to find some class of parameterized systems for which we know, um, in particular, that, that the parameterized verification problem is decidable, and, and actually we want a bit more we want to have a reduction from, from arbitrary size systems. So if you, if you want to verify, we want to be able to reduce the arbitrary system to a fixed size system. So this, uh, this class of systems, this contains the architecture, but it might contain additional restrictions on, uh, on what, what these components can do, how they, how they communicate, uh, and so on. And so we want to have this reduction and then use a very similar approach um, as before, except that now we, we have to satisfy in the synthesis algorithm additional conditions that guarantee that the system or the component that we generate uh, will be in this class. So we want, to, we want to synthesize something that is in this class such that we can, we can use this reduction in order to, to guarantee the correctness for an arbitrary number of components. So what we did is we extended this, this power synthesis approach with an encoding of the system class. This can be either done by modifying the LTL specification or by directly going into the synthesis algorithm, uh, which in this case uses an SMT encoding of the problem. Uh, and, and if the SMT solver gives you back a model, then that model can be translated to an implementation. Okay, so we have different places where we can, can ensure this. The, the high level idea is that we, we, need to, we need to add some restrictions to the synthesis algorithm such that what we get is in this class which ensures that we can use the reduction for reasoning. And if we, if we have this reduction, so if we know that for a given specification and the system in this class, we can use a reduction uh, from the parameterized case to some, some case of fixed size, then we, do, we, we turn the argument around and we synthesize something for this fixed size and we know by the reduction what, what, is, what is correct in this fixed size will also be correct uh, for an arbitrary size so we can can use replication uh, to get a bigger system, and by this reduction argument, we know that the bigger system will also be correct. Okay, here's a, a simple example now. Um, a, a, a distributed arbiter that that does like this, this specification is a subset of what we wanted to do for for the AMBA case study. It has two simple properties. One is the request response. For every component, it should be that. If it gets a request, it should finally give a grant. But then again, we should have mutual exclusion for every two different components. Uh, it should be the case that uh, always, 
we don't have that uh, I and J give a grant at the same time. So this is uh, fairly simple, um, but the question that we now have to answer is, we need some class of problem for systems for which we have this reduction, and what would be a suitable class of problem for system for this um, specification that we want to, to um, for which we want to synthesize an implementation. Okay, and we looked around for existing reduction results, and what we found uh, that, that fits this uh, are token rings, a cutoff result for token rings uh, by Yemes and Nangashi. Um, so essentially, in a token ring, what we have is that the, the processes only communicate each other by passing a token around in the ring. This token doesn't, doesn't have a value that you can change. It's just whether you have the token or you don't have it. OK, and Emerson and Yoshi have shown that um, for systems where processes only communicate by passing this token in a ring and specifications um, in this logic LTL without next, um, depending on how many processes the specification talks about, you can determine uh, which size of system you have to look at to guarantee that, that the same implementation will also be correct for an arbitrary size system. So if your, if your formula only talks about a single process, then the cutoff is two, so you only need to consider a ring of two where, where, the, where the processes pass the token back and forth. And if it's a formula that talks about two processes, uh, then you need a ring of size four. Okay, that's the two cases that we had in the example of specification that I showed before. <coughs> And we get from this corollary, if we want to parameter synthesis, then we can synthesize a, a process in a system of this size. Uh, and well, if it, if it then satisfies simplification naturally by synthesis, then it also satisfies simplification in, in any big array. OK. Um, the, the point here, so um, this is related, related to what I showed before. We need to ensure that that what we synthesize satisfies some additional conditions. And um, so the additional conditions here would be, uh, on the one hand, the interleaving semantics that, that they need to get this cutoff result, and on the other hand, um, fair token passing, which is assumed to, to get this cutoff result. So these two additional conditions need to be guaranteed by the synthesis algorithm. If, if they don't hold, then the theorem doesn't apply, and we can, can't be sure that, that the system will be correct. OK, so this we need to integrate into our synthesis algorithm. <clears throat> OK, so now we're back uh, at, at this example specification. And we know that if we synthesize it in a token ring with four processes, because that's, that's the maximum that we need between these two, um, then, then the resulting implementation will be correct for any size. So and we, we uh, produced the, the S&T formula that bounded synthesis gives us, and, and the S&T solver um, gives us back a result in, in about 10 seconds. So that's not too bad. And yeah, the, the cover results guarantee now that, that what we got back will be correct for an arbitrary number of components. So that was um, our first um, experimental results with this basic approach. Um, of course, this is a very simple example. And, and th this class of, of uh, systems might not be suitable for, for all um, for all systems, so we have these challenges. One is scalability in the size of the specification. So even if we even have, if we have a fixed number of components, it might still be the case that for a large specification, uh, synthesis still needs too much time or doesn't doesn't terminate. Um, and the other the other thing is uh, we rely on these reduction results. And whenever we want to synthesize a system, we need to be sure that we have such a reduction result that we can use. OK, so with that in mind, uh, let's, let's go back to um, the application that I talked about before, the synthesis of the AMBA bus controller. Um, so as I mentioned, the, this has been considered before. So what we chose is we, we assumed um, that we can still use this, this token ring architecture, since in general, so, so the, the, the global property that has to be guaranteed is also mutual exclusion, as in the simple example that I showed before. And the other properties of the AMBA bus controller are um, <coughs> more or less all, all of them are local properties that, that don't require communication uh, between the components. 
Okay, so we, what we want to use is, is this reduction that I mentioned before and the garment synthesis approach adapted for to token rings. Okay. Um, now, the problem is uh, that the original reduction results are for interleaving semantics, as I mentioned. Uh, but what we want to do is synthesize a controller for AMBA uh, in hardware. So there we would have a synchronous, um, a synchronous system model. So uh, this doesn't quite fit. And we actually, so this is the full specification of AMBA. Um, it, it existed before, we just had to adapt it a bit to, to make it uh, parameterized. And when looking, so you don't have to, have to read this or so, I just want to give you an idea. This is, this is really some uh, substantial number of, of formulas that all need to be satisfied by the system. These are assumptions, these are guarantees. And if you look at them, um, you find uh, some additional problems that are not supported by the existing results. One of them, we have universal quantification in the assumptions, um, which means, so this is an implication, if the assumptions hold, then the guarantees hold. So effectively, we have quantified alternation between assumptions and guarantees, and this is not supported uh, by the cutoff results. And we have the next operator, which is also not allowed by our logic LTL without the next operator. So we have to find solutions for, for these uh, cases. So to, to do that, uh, we extended the cutoff results in, in several dimensions, allowing synchronous systems, allowing the local next operator, and allowing um, global assumptions um, on, on the inputs of all processes. So this is, I will not go into the details of that, that's just, we had to do some, some theoretical work in the background to extend the existing reduction results um, such that they fit this uh, more complex example. Okay, and uh, on, on the synthesis side, what we had to do is, since we have such a big specification, uh, we had to optimize uh, the synthesis algorithm um, in different respects to, to allow to, to synthesize something that, that satisfies all of this. <clears throat> and I want to talk a bit more about the optimization. So uh, we implemented the approach and we tried to synthesize controllers that, that satisfy a subset of the AMBA properties. Not all of them, so this is uh, roughly an increasing uh, complexity. Uh, well, there are three uh, more complex specifications. Simple is essentially what I showed you before. Then there's uh, full and familiar, which which are successively more more complex specifications, and then the numbers give you, give you how many processes we, we tried to, to synthesize. <clears throat> okay, and the original approach, if you just naively take uh, the bound synthesis approach from the, from the paper and um, give it to the SMT solver, um, we can synthesize a simple specification for four processes and the, the familiar for, for two processes and none of the others. Everything times out, time out is, is two hours. Okay, so this is not very promising. But actually, so we, we did some uh, general optimizations, what we call the, the counter optimization. This is um, actually an optimization in, in a step in between. So the, the bounded synthesis goes from, from the RTL formula to an automaton representation and then to the SMT. So this is already on the level from, from LTL to the automaton level. And this is, this is general for, for any specification in any kind of system. Uh, this allowed us to, to synthesize uh, one additional example and be faster on the others. Uh, and then we have bottom-up optimization. This is, if you have systems like we have, we have multiple components and all of them should be the same, then it's easier to, to go bottom-up instead of top-down. Um, so this also gives us some, some significant speed up. Then there's uh, a strengthening optimization. This is, uh, this is incomplete, so you, uh, you make your formula um, we strengthen your formula such that uh, there are less systems that, that satisfy it, but, but the formula becomes simpler. Um, so the, the drawback here is that if it doesn't work, you might have to go back and check the original formula again. But on the other hand, we see here that it gives a huge speed up on, on many examples. So just to correct, what, what are these uh, uh, optimization as some guarantee exactly that you, that you uh, um, maybe an example that how? So essentially here, the, the strengthening is we, we separate um, we separate the specification into, into safety and lightness parts, uh, both for the assumptions and for the guarantees. So we have safety assumptions and safety guarantees, and we have lightness assumptions and lightness guarantees. And we strengthen the specification by saying, um, to guarantee safety, so for the safety guarantees, we don't need the lightness assumptions. It's 
a somewhat reasonable assumption. It doesn't always work, but uh, in many cases it works and makes synthesis much faster because the, the, the safety properties can be uh, the safety the safety guarantees are a big part of the guarantees. And if for them you don't need the Leibniz assumptions, then, then everything goes much faster. <coughs> okay. And finally, we have the, the modular um, optimization. This is actually in the example that I showed before. Uh, we had one we have one formula with that talk about one process and one formula that talks about two processes. So we took the maximum of the of the size um, and, and synthesized everything in this big system. But actually, what you can do is you can you can modularize um, the synthesis, um, so what, what you get in, in synthesis is, I mentioned, it is encoded into s &T problem. You can do the encoding separately, so if you have a formula, actually for, for the Amba example, for example, uh, almost all of the, of the properties talk about a single process, and there's only one or two properties that talk about two processes. So you encode all the, all the single process properties into, into s &T, for a system of, of size two, and the others for a system of size four, and then you can combine these S and T uh, formulas and and let let them be solved by the S and T solver, getting a much smaller S and T problem and again a, a big speed up. So what you can see here is that we have a speed up of uh, more than two orders of magnitude, and, and uh, this would be a, a sum and complete, so right? you don't lose uh, behavior. You don't. In this case, you don't lose anything. So the only place where you could lose something is in strengthening. But there you could you could realize it. So if it's if it becomes un unrealizable, then you have to go back to the original script. Okay. And you try not to strengthen and just go directly from one level to modular and see whether you are still complete and uh, maybe not so bad in time. Um, so I mean, you do counters one level to modular and not. I'm, I'm sure we tried it, but I, okay. I don't have the numbers here. Okay, so. These optimizations uh, brought us reasonably close to, to the uh, full AMBA specification. Uh, I will not, so we had to do a bit more work for, for AMBA actually, so we, we, um, mm, we had some additional incomplete things where, where the, the designer makes some choices that are not left to the synthesis algorithm. Um, and then we were able uh, to use our synthesis tool, uh, Party, um, to solve the general parameterized synthesis problem for AMBA. So this is the, the situation with the existing tools, or one of these existing tools, and uh, Party synthesizes uh, with the synthesis time being independent of the number of masters, gives us uh, one component implementation that can be plugged together to get a controller for any size, and the circuit size um, of AMBA is, is linear in, in the number of masters and actually, so, so if P is the, the process that you're uh, synthesizing, then P is also guaranteed to be as small as possible by our, by our synthesis approach. So we get something that is linear in the number and has a very small uh, component. So this was a very nice example, uh, was a very nice result. And um, that uh, finishes the second part, unless there are more questions. Um, yeah, one question. How do you choose what architecture to use? Like for this? this is currently done by the designer. I mean, um, actually, I will, I will get to that now. Um, um, so there, there are a lot of results. Maybe I, I, I do it here. Um, so actually, that, that was the next question. So we, we did this for, we did it for, for one uh, class of parameter systems. Then the next question is, well, what classes are there? From, from what can we choose? Mm -hmm. And actually, that, that was not, not that easy to answer. So if you look at, if you look at the literature, um, we first looked at decidability and undecidability results for parameterized verification in general. And here, that there's many separate results, many different papers. All of them use their own notation, use their own assumptions. Sometimes the assumptions are implicit. Uh, the system models are different. different. So it's hard to, to really just Take a paper from the literature and, and, and see how it fits into the approach. Um, so what we did was we, we started a, uh, what, what turned out to be a, a project over a few years to collect, compare, and unify the existing results um, 
for, and, and we have to restrict ourselves to, to systems essentially as I presented them, uh, with finite state components that are um, uniform. Uh, so every component in the system has either the same implementation or all the implementations are fixed, uh, are, are picked from, from a finite set. I Another approach would have been to look at, uh, at uh, desirability results for distributed synthesis. Right? I mean, right. Distributed synthesis is undecidable, and then there are all these results about certain architectures, very simple ones, yeah. uh, okay. uh, which are decidable, and look if, 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 if these results still hold on, on in the parameterized case. Yes, right. Uh, mm, so but the it other appeared to me uh, that, that, uh, that the existing the results for distributed synthesis are um, are very limited. So the architecture are, are essentially pipelines or, or variants of that, where you cannot have um, so your essentially your processes cannot be cannot have different information or, or there must be a hierarchy of the information in, in the system. So one one process at least must have must have all the information that the other processes have, and that is not very interesting for us. Um, and uh, I'm not aware of of Results where where um, where distributed synthesis is desirable and it would be particularly interesting for us at least. <clears throat> but yes, that, that is also a, a, a direction that yeah, I, I, I kind of skipped over this. But even if, even if the parameterized verification problem is desirable, uh, the the synthesis problem that we reduced to might still be or in general is still undesirable. Okay. So this is kind of the overview of the result that we got from collecting all these uh, all these separate results from the literature. Um, so essentially, we identified four different classes of systems. They are they are separated by how they communicate, how the process communicates. We have token classes, <coughs> like the token rings that I presented. We have systems that uh, that communicate by rendezvous or broadcasts. So rendezvous means two processes do something in lockstep. They synchronize. Broadcast means one process. Uh, broadcast something to all his neighbors. Uh, then we have guard protocols. I will talk a bit more about them later. Essentially, they have they have transitions that are guarded by statements of, about the rest of the system. And we have ad hoc networks, which are like they have broadcast communication, but in addition, they um, they have networks that can change during execution. Okay, and we identified some existing results for all of these, and we. We put all, all of them together in a basic model with some extensions that allow us to, to really compare the results and to, to bring them in a common framework. And we identify also uh, whether, whether the existing results uh, support a single or multiple process templates, uh, synchronization primitives, and what kind of specifications are, are supported and what kind of topologies. So rings, arbitrary, or only clicks, or yeah, different things. So these are the thing that you list are Decidable things, or uh, not everything here is decidable. This is what has been considered in the literature, and subsets of this uh, have been identified to be decidable. So I, I have some information about decidability here. This is for for token passing systems. So for every class of these systems, we identified such such a map of decidability, where the gray parts are undecidable, the white parts are decidable. So the white boxes are decidable, and, and what's between the boxes is unknown. Um, so I will not go into too much detail. This is essentially from two different papers. There's the, the one paper for the rings that I mentioned before, and, and uh, Namiyoshi. And uh, there's another paper by Clark and others uh, that identified token passing in, in general graphs, uh, what, what is possible there. And you see here that there's, there's many things that haven't been considered. Oh, well, actually, this, this undesirability result, this is if the token uh, can have multiple values, then it, then it immediately becomes undecidable. Uh, this has been shown uh, by Suzuki um, already before these two other results. And <clears throat> actually, from this paper, uh, a large area here was, was not known before we started our work. So while collecting these results, we already identified um, holes in the existing uh, knowledge, and uh, this here actually was not known before. This this here is, is from one of our papers, um, because uh, what we have up here is a distinction whether or not in in a general graph 
the processes can choose where to send the token or whether it's uh, non-deterministic. And all, all, the, all the results before, uh, either there were no, no different directions in a unilateral ring, or in a general network, uh, processes could not choose where to send the token. And that makes it easier for, for parameterized verification. Uh, and we looked at the case uh, where, where processes can choose directions. And well, as you've seen before, results here are not, not very promising. Uh, actually, we also looked at something different, but it doesn't show up in this chart. I will, I will mention it briefly later. OK, and then we also looked at guard protocols. Um, as I mentioned before, here we get a different map of desirability. And uh, looking at this and looking at applications in synthesis, we identify other, other things that are not possible with the current results. Um, in particular, um, the, the existing results do not assume fairness of, of the scheduler and therefore are, are not very well suited to, to reason about liveness properties of the system. Because a liveness property, if you, if you don't assume a fair scheduler, liveness um, that, that refers to liveness property that refers to one process in the system can always be violated simply by, by the scheduler not, not scheduling that process anymore. So uh, these, these existing results, all of them were not very useful for, for us if we want to talk about systems with liveness properties. So the arrows are just how you do the reductions, right? You do reduction. Right. The arrows in this in this uh, in these charts are how you do the reduction. So this is the original result, and the, the undesirability of this follows because it's uh, it in, these problems include this problem, and the same for for this here. Yeah. yeah. The arrows point to the original result in the paper. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's talk a bit about token passing systems. So we, here we, we observe that the existing results are limited, as I mentioned. So they're limited either to a non-branching non topology, like token rings, or to non-branching specifications. So the, the paper that considered general graphs for token passing did not consider branching specifications. So LTL instead of, instead of CTL. Uh, and also what I mentioned before, processes that do not control and, and cannot even observe the, the directions in the network. So also if a process receives the token, it doesn't know where it came from, if it has multiple neighbors that could have sent it. Okay, we, we considered all of these cases, branching topologies, branching specifications, and uh, processes that can, can observe these different directions, and ask the question, well, which of these cases are, are decidable? And in general, as, as I've shown in the picture before, uh, the, the results are not very, very good, but actually we did identify um, some, some places where you can get cutoffs. So if, if you have branching topologies and branching specifications, in general it becomes undesirable. But if you put a bound on the branching of a specification, then it's desirable. So you get undesirability in, in general, but for every fixed bound on the branching, you get desirability, which is, which is good enough for, for most applications. Uh, we prove undesirability in general if the processes control the directions. This is not so nice. And uh, we were able to obtain concrete cutoffs that allow us to reduce um, reasoning about big systems to, to reasoning about the cutoff systems for a number of well-behaved topologies like rings, clicks, stars. So for every topology, you need to analyze it again, use our proof methods to find the concrete cutoffs for that topology. <clears throat> okay, so that was for rings. Questions? Uh, for, for token passing systems? Yeah, just a question. Um, and, uh, okay, desirability and desirability results, but did you actually try to synthesize uh, or try to do exactly what you did before with these type of programs? I uh, think these types of, of, of uh, 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 architectures and how um, did they perform well or, or it didn't perform or? So I think we didn't do synthesis for these. We, we had some experiments with, with the next example that I will show. <clears throat> this is guard protocols. So here we have systems that can have multiple, multiple process templates, as we call them, multiple uh, different components. So um, we consider systems where we have one component of type A and many components of type B. But actually, these results um, generalize to an arbitrary number of components, an arbitrary number of, of templates, and an arbitrary number of, of each of them in the system. OK, and uh, the transitions of a single component in this system can be, can be guarded by expressions of the form either that there must exist another process that is in a certain set of states of its local state space. So 
So if I if I want to go from from A to B, then there must somebody, must exist somebody else who is currently in C. Or 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 a guard of the form, all the other processes need to be in some certain subset of their state space. Like if I if I want to take the step into the critical section, then everybody else should be not in the critical section. Okay, we have specifications similar to, to those before in LTL without the next operator that talk about A and the fixed number K of copies of B. And uh, as I said before, there are some limitations here. Uh, they don't consider fairness of scheduling these existing results. Um, then they only consider closed systems and their specifications are, are somehow limited. So these two uh, interact with each other. If, the, if these specifications would allow to express fairness, then it would also be fine. But uh, they don't allow to express fairness, and they also don't allow to, um, to approximate uh, liveness by safety, because we don't have the next operator. Uh, so we really need fairness to, to, be, to reason about progress in the system. Okay, and uh, so we, we looked at these systems and we considered, in addition to the non-fair case, we considered the fair case. And for, for properties, we showed that, so the, the existing result showed that the cutoff is linear in the size of the process template and linear in the number of, of processes that we talk about. And for conjunctive systems, it's only linear in the number of processes, but doesn't depend on the, on the size of the process template. And for fairness, for fair systems, we, we showed that now we get an additional constant factor uh, here, um, because we, the, the, the construction simply is a bit, a bit more complicated. Okay, and to, to obtain a, a fair construction for conjunctive systems, we needed to um, to restrict the system a little bit. Um, so, so disjunctive conjunctive, conjunctive systems are systems where all the guards are only of one of the types. Either, either the, all of them are disjunctive or all of them are conjunctive. Okay, in addition to that, we needed to, to have cutoffs for, for deadlock detection of the whole system or of one process, and there we also get uh, cutoffs that are uh, linear in the size of the, the process template. Okay, and the, the orange ones are the ones that, that we that we have as new results, and these are the existing ones. So either they're completely no, they're they're, they're new, yeah. Okay. And then what we also showed is that, that these cutoffs that we have here are actually tight. So you cannot reduce it by even by even a constant of one, uh, because then there then we have counter examples that, that the system behaves differently than the system of, of uh, size uh, with one additional process. So um, except for for the green one up there, all of these cutoffs are tight. So for for these systems, they cannot exist as one cut. <clears throat> and these cutoffs directly support open systems. Of course, you could support open systems by by translating a, 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 an open system to a closed system. But since that leads to a blow up in the state space, this also increases the, the cutoff, and that simply is not uh, um, not tractable anymore. So uh, we show that, that the cutoffs actually support open systems directly uh, without any additional cost. Okay. Finally, I think this is the last thing uh, that I want to mention. Um, this is an overview of of different synthesis approaches that that we. Um, developed that, that are orthogonal to this. So you might uh, you might want to have or construct systems that have uh, properties that are not supported by the current synthesis approaches. What could such properties, properties be? For example, compositionality. Um, in our case, this means uh, assume guarantee synthesis, where if you synthesize a system with different components. Um, you want these uh, components to, to be interchangeable. So uh, if you synthesize a system with, say, two components, and you exchange one component by a new implementation, that, but that also satisfies the old specification, plus maybe some, some additional properties, then you want uh, the whole system still to work, to, to still satisfy the global specification, without having to re-synthesize re also the other, the other uh, component for which the specification has not changed. And this is, this is not guaranteed in general, and if you want to guarantee it, we show here how it can be done. Okay, another thing is fault tolerance. If you talk about large distributed systems, you always need to, um, need to assume that some of them could fail due to hardware errors or communication errors. Um, so we showed how to extend the underlying bounded synthesis approach to systems that support self-stabilization and Byzantine fault tolerance. 
and uh, yeah, this, this requires some, <coughs> some modification of the encoding and also some, some new uh, algorithms. And finally, um, you might want stronger specifications. Um, LTL might not cover everything you want. For example, we considered here an extension of LTL that's called prompt LTL, where so in, in LTL, or especially as I mentioned, LTL without next, um, you have the problem that uh, that you can only uh, specify progress in the system by saying eventually something should happen. But this eventually doesn't, doesn't have a bound, and, and over the execution of the system, uh, the, the intervals between these, uh, these events might, might grow, and might grow unboundedly. And prompt LTL allows you to put symbolic bounds on the satisfaction of the eventualities, so um, you cannot at least not have this, this infinite growth of or unbounded growth of, of these intervals between the satisfaction of the eventualities. Okay, and that's pretty much it. I will quickly summarize what I, what I told you. Um, so what we did in this area is we defined the parameter synthesis approach, we optimized it and then applied it to this unbound case study. This is the first general approach for, for automatic synthesis of parameter systems. Mm. To be able to, to apply to a broader set of systems, we, we surveyed the existing desirability results in parameter verification, and we obtained new desirability results and cutoffs reductions for these two classes. And finally, we extended the underlying synthesis approaches to support stronger properties um, for, for the components. And there are, of course, always a number of challenges that, that still could be tackled. Um, one of them is, of course, integrate and extend more cutoff results for broader classes of systems. Um, then more efficient solving of synthesis problems, of course, always a problem in, in that direction. My main role is organizing the synthesis competition where other people hand in their tools and, and we try to, to find out who has the most efficient synthesis tool. <coughs> and uh, finally, we are also developing completely new approaches for contrast synthesis that do not uh, do not rely on, on such fixed reduction results, but um, try to develop kind of the, the components and the proof of correctness, the parameters proof of, of correctness in, in, uh, in parallel. And um, that's it. Thank you. So, any other questions? Um, so far, you kind of, so as, as, at least as I understand, you were uh, looking at more static systems, so you had a fixed number of components for runtime. Have you had experience in going to like dynamic systems, where, for instance, you during runtime like one client appears or one master appears? Um, no, uh, so we didn't look at, at synthesis for that. Uh, as I mentioned in, in the in our parameterized verification survey, we we had some results that allow these ad hoc networks where the network topology can change, and I believe also processes can disappear and can appear. Uh, but we didn't look at synthesis in that case. But um, I, I think the results that they have are not strong enough to, to synthesize any interesting algorithms. You would have to significantly, can significantly extend them to, to do something in, in synthesis. Thank you. You referred several times to your proof methods, uh, but didn't say anything specific mm -hmm. about it. Is it kind of that you, know, you, that you could use variants of, of Emerson's and then Joshi's results, or uh, and, and reductions, or did, did you have any kind of novel proof techniques? Uh, you know, were they needed to obtain your results? Um, yeah, we had a combination actually. So for for these token passing systems, we combined what uh, what Emerson and Nandoshi did, what what Clark and others did, and another result. Um, I don't remember the others. Um, so essentially, um, we developed an, an algorithm that, that goes over to topology and and marks uh, puts a marking on each node that, that tells you which nodes are reachable and with which. Um, additional conditions that different nodes are reachable from other nodes and we need the bound k here for this marking algorithm to terminate 
the bound on the branching of the formula, because that if you have a CTL star formula, you can, you can essentially encode how the token moves through this topology, and um, we need a bound on the branching to at some time have this, this, uh, this marking algorithm over the topology terminate. And then when you have complete marking for your, for your topology, uh, then you can use that again uh, when you need another inductive argument uh, to improve your cutoff for your system. So, um, Yes, we use some of their, their methods, but we also had to, to combine them in new ways and, and to, to develop our own. And for the, for the guarded protocols, it's, it's similar. There, the original result was by Emerson and Kadam, and we, we reused their constructions, but we also had to develop new constructions that explicitly su support fairness, because their old, their old constructions explicitly violated the fairness condition. Okay. Then uh, this thing is okay.